Dr. Bott, thanks for being with me today. It's my pleasure. Your work is really interesting. You're exploring the microbiome of cancer patients. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Traditionally, the focus of improving cancer outcomes has really been staunchly on trying to improve therapies. Um, so we're hearing a lot at this big data and medicine conference about precision medicine, identifying targetable mutations in malignancies. I mean, while that's a very important piece of the puzzle, what I know as a clinical physician is that a lot of our patients actually respond well to therapies but end up dying or suffering from complications. Many of these complications we actually believe to be related to their state of immunosuppression. Um, so these patients are treated with chemotherapies that really wipe out their immune system. They're treated with lots of antibiotics that actually wipe out a lot of the good microbes that live within them. And so our fundamental hypothesis is that a subset of these complications in cancer patients are due to alterations in the microbiome. We hope to identify those alterations and then target them with the hope of improving cancer outcomes. Um, so it's what I like to call kind of not so sexy precision medicine. <laughs> not so sort of sexy. It's kind of an interesting way to go about it. You're not even targeting the cancer, but you might extend the life and certainly provide a better quality of life in that way. Yes, that is our intense hope. Um, we're also very interested in using our technologies to potentially identify new infectious causes of malignancy. Um, so you may or may not know that over 15% of all cancers are actually known to have an infectious trigger. Um, we know that the epidemiology of cancer in resource-limited settings, so low- and middle-income countries, mm -hmm. is very different than the epidemiology of cancers that we see in the United States, for example. Uh, and so we actually believe that some of these cancers may be triggered by infections that we have yet to discover. So one of the nice things that uh, has happened with the boom of technology, uh, both on the molecular side of things and also on the computational side of things, is we have the ability to potentially identify these novel infectious triggers of cancer. So some of them are, are quite well known in the public, cervical sure. cancer and HPV. Can you give an example of maybe one that is surprising or was surprising to you? So I think one of the cancers that we think very little about here in the United States is bladder cancer. Um, bladder cancer actually isn't even in the top five most common mm -hmm. cancers here in the United States, although it is devastating. It turns out that in Egypt, uh, bladder cancer is the number one most common cancer. Oh, wow. uh, and the reason it is the number one most common cancer is that there's a very high rate of infection in males especially with the worm called Schistosoma hematobium. And so we actually, believe that, uh -huh. yes, we actually believe that this small worm um, that lives in fresh water actually triggers this cancer. So that's an interesting kind of relationship between a small organism and malignancy that we don't often think about. So this happens to be one of the cancers that we're really interested in. We're interested in understanding the genetics of this organism and also understanding how it impacts the human cells to cause cancer. So it's almost using genetics as a way to prevent cancer as opposed Absolutely. to treat it. Absolutely. What do you think, if you could fast forward 10 years from now, where do you think that uh, your field will be? What will be the questions that we've already answered? Sure. I think we'll be able to identify lots of associations between alterations in the microbiome, so bacteria, viruses, and fungi within us, and clinical outcomes. I think what it's going to allow us to do is actually have a huge lead time in designing interventions. Uh, so one of the things that we're seeing over and over in the literature now is that alterations in the microbiome actually precede clinical symptoms. Oh. You could imagine that we may end up finding that alterations in the microbiome precede a diagnosis of breast cancer or lung cancer, allowing us to potentially identify problems like cancer before they have spread and become incurable. So you're saying that by sampling someone's gut bacteria, we might be able to diagnose cancers earlier? That's my hope. It's really exciting. Certainly within the realm of possibility. Dr. Bott, thank you so much for being with me today. My pleasure. Thank you.